In the book of Jude, the verse that I would like to focus on is verse number four, where the Bible reads, For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And the title of the sermon this morning is, Turning Grace into Lasciviousness. Turning grace into lasciviousness. First of all, what does the word lasciviousness mean? It means unbridled lust, licentiousness. It means wantonness, outrageousness, shamelessness, lewdness. Basically, to understand the word lasciviousness, basically you would just think of somebody just doing whatever they want to gratify their flesh. Just if it feels good, do it. That's lasciviousness, just a total unbridled lust and fulfillment of the lusts of the flesh. And the Bible is warning about false prophets and men that would creep in unawares that would turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Now, what you need to understand about the book of Jude is that it's warning us about multiple kinds of false prophets. It's not just one type of false prophet or just one false doctrine that's out there. False doctrine comes in many shapes and sizes. That's why he said, Woe unto them, for they've gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Those are three distinct men. They did not teach the same lies. They did not teach the same false doctrine. Cain's problem was a works-based salvation. He brought the works of his own hands. Instead of just trusting in the blood of the lamb, he was basically believing in a works-based salvation, the fruit of his own hands. But the gainsaying of Korah had nothing to do with that. But Balaam's prophecy for money had nothing to do with that. So God is listing all these different types of false teachers and the types of false doctrine. He's not just warning us about one guy. He's warning us about all different types of false prophets. Now, some false prophets, and obviously this is the majority, teach that salvation is by works. That's a major false doctrine. That's the way of Cain. But there's another false doctrine out there that basically teaches that, yes, salvation's by grace. It's not by works. But then they go a step further and they say that because of God's grace, we can just do whatever we want. Now, I'm not talking about for salvation, folks, because truly, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter how you live, you're still going to be saved because whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. But what these people are teaching is that not just in regard to salvation, but in every area of our lives, we can basically live however we want and still be blessed with God by God, still be right with God. God's still pleased with us. God's still blessing us no matter what we do. They turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness, meaning that they take the grace of God, God's forgiveness, and say, this is a license for me to just live however I want with no consequence. This is just an open door to lasciviousness. I can go out and just live a lascivious life. I'm going to go out and live a lascivious life because of the fact that God's grace is there. Now, this doctrine has some people that teach it in a very extreme form, and then there are varying shades of this. But let me just say this, because you, you might think this is an obscure teaching. Nobody believes that. Nobody follows that. But how this manifests in your typical non-denominational church or your typical neo-evangelical church is they'll teach you we're free in Christ. We have Christian liberty. Therefore, don't come at me with a bunch of do's and don'ts from the Bible. Now, if you've spent any time in the neo-evangelical movement or in non-denominational type churches, you've heard this before. If you've been in the Calvary Chapel style churches, you'll hear this idea. And I, if I had a nickel for every time I heard it, I'd be a wealthy man. You see, I grew up independent, fundamental Baptist in soul winning type churches. But when I was about 12 years old, the church that we were in split and fell apart. And we struggled to find a good fundamental Baptist church. And so we ended up making the mistake of just throwing up our hands and going to the liberal Baptist church that was sort of the rock and roll NIV-styled church. And we went to two churches, like actually three churches like that, 
over the course of five years. So I spent five years in the new evangelical type Baptist churches, the rock and roll fun center type Baptist churches. And I can tell you, this is what they teach and believe every week. I mean, it's just, it's constantly this thing of, Christian liberty, we're free in Christ, and what they mean by that is that if you start preaching to them, hey, this is a sin, you need to stop doing it, don't do that, they'll just come at you with, hey, whoa, why are you trying to bring me back into bondage? We're free, man. So they think free means we just should just do whatever we want. No restrictions, no rules, and they often criticize churches that preach hard on sin, and they'll say, oh, those churches are just preaching a bunch of do's and don'ts. But it's about the relationship, man. It's not a religion. It's a relationship. But the Bible teaches that religion is a good thing. The Bible says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. To keep himself unspotted from the world. God says that our religion ought to keep us unspotted from the world. God said, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. The Bible says the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now, what must we do to be saved? Only believe. Just believe. Okay, but what should we do? We should live godly. We should live soberly, righteously, godly. We should abstain from worldly lust. We should get the sin out of our life. There's a difference between what we should do and what we must do to be saved. And this is where the confusion is coming in. What must we do to be saved? Only believe. It's only by grace. We're not under the law, but under grace. Okay, that's salvation. But when it comes to the way that we live our lives, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He didn't say keep my suggestions. He didn't say keep my promptings and proddings of the Holy Spirit. He said keep my commandments. Jesus said that the Great Commission is to go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe whatsoever things I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way even at the end of the world. He said, you need to go out and preach the gospel, yes, but not just the gospel. You need to teach people to observe everything that I've commanded. We are to preach the commandments of God. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same should be called great in the kingdom of heaven. God expects us to preach the commandments of God. God expects us to follow the commandments of God. Do we have to follow them to get into heaven? No, but in order to be blessed by God, and in order for God to be pleased with us, we have to follow them. Now, it's sort of like the relationship between a parent and a child. If my children break my rules, they're still my child. I'm still going to love them. That's the grace of God right there. We are still his children. Even if we sin, we're still saved. We're still God's children. The grace of God has covered our sins. But does that mean that I just let my children do whatever they want? Now, truly, if they do whatever, they're still going to be my kids. Just like no matter what we do, we're still God's children if we've believed on Christ. But my children, if they break my rules, are going to be punished. And the, look, no parent is happy with their child if their child is just continually disobeying. No parent is going to have a good relationship with their child if their child is continually disobeying. Okay, but this false doctrine basically teaches that God's never mad at you. God's always pleased with you. And, and, oh, God's blessings have nothing to do with your obedience. They're just freely given to everybody who's saved. Just blessings and blessings and blessings. No, wrong. If you disobey God's commandments, God is going to punish you. He's not going to send you to hell because you're saved. You're, you have eternal life. But he'll punish us in this life. He will be displeased with us. He will bring chastening and chastisement upon us. Now, this seems like a very basic truth. But I'll tell you, out there amongst the Fun Center crowd, they do not understand this. And they are constantly, when you come at them with a Bible verse that says, don't do this, this is what they'll say. Well, 
I'm glad that the Holy Spirit has spoken to you about that. Yeah. But the Holy Spirit hasn't spoken to me about that. You know, I just have peace about doing that. Even though God said not to do it, I just have peace about it. And I'm just being led of the Spirit. And I'm not under the law, I'm led of the Spirit. And so you're trying to kind of bring me back under bondage. And here's what they'll call you, a legalist. Ah, oh, you legalist. You know what? I'm a legalist then. I'm a legalist. You know what? Legalist, let's break it down. What does ist mean? It means you believe in something. What is a Buddhist? Somebody who believes in Buddha, right? What's a legalist? Somebody who believes in the law of God? Amen. I'm a legalist. I believe in the law of God. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converted. So, oh, how love I thy law. It's my meditation night and day. Amen. Do we then make void the law? Through grace, look at Romans chapter 3, if you would. Romans chapter number 3. This is a key verse, my friend. Romans chapter 3, because there are people out there that are turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Right. The true doctrine is that we're saved by grace. The false doctrine is that God's grace means that we can do whatever we want and he'll still bless us and be happy with us and no one can tell us to stop. Whether it's drinking fornicating, smoking. It's just like, nope, don't tell me to stop. I'm under grace. Hey, the Bible says not to print any marks on your body, but I can get a tattoo because I'm under grace. That's the false doctrine out there. Yeah. Now, you can get a tattoo and still go to heaven, but God does not approve of you getting a tattoo because he said, don't print any marks on your body. But then people print marks on their body because they're under grace. This is the kind of nonsense that comes out of this teaching. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse number... Well, let's just start in verse 28 because it says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Amen. But look at verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? Are we just going to completely negate the law now? He says, God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So we don't make void the law through faith. We establish the law. God's law is still there. God's commandments are still there. And God does not just give us a free-for-all and just tell us, live however you want. I mean, is that what you do with your kids in your home? Now, some of you don't answer that because I've seen how your kids behave. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, you know, we don't give our kids a free-for-all. We have rules. We ought to have rules for our kids. And we need to teach them how to behave themselves in the house of God. Amen. We need to teach them what is right and what is wrong. We need to discipline and chasten them early, the Bible teaches. And God's the same way. He doesn't just have a free-for-all. So you see, there's two false extremes. The one false extreme is teaching, oh, salvation's by works. You can't live however you want and still go to heaven. That's a false doctrine. But then there's another just extreme overreaction that says, well, not only is salvation by grace through faith, everything's by grace through faith. And, you know, does all the blessings of God are just automatically yours just because you believe in Jesus. Don't ever feel bad when you do wrong things. Well, what about when James told us to be afflicted and mourn and weep? Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he'll lift you up. Amen. Why did God tell us to mourn and be afflicted and weep when we have sin in our lives? We're supposed to feel bad. We're supposed to get right. With God. We're supposed to repent of our sins on a daily basis. Amen. The problem is when you mix that in with salvation. Right. So we need to separate things here. There's being saved. That's real easy. Believing in Christ. But then once we're saved, we can't just keep just saying, oh, grace, grace, grace. No, no, no. We need to actually do the work that he told us to do. And we need to actually obey the commandments that he told us to obey. Right. Now go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Another thing to notice about the book of Jude is that Jude is a parallel passage with 2 Peter chapter 2. Now when we talk about a parallel passage, we mean that there are two chapters that teach the same thing and they even go in the same order. They kind of hit the same points. And God puts a lot of chapters like this in the Bible so that we can compare and contrast and we can learn a deeper truth. For example, when we compare Matthew with Mark. So if we find the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew and then we find the Sermon on the Mount in Luke, those would be known as parallel passages because they're teaching the same doctrines. We can compare them and learn more. We could take books like Ephesians and Colossians that have a lot of parallel passages. Colossians 3 is parallel with Ephesians 5. And when we compare them, 
we can learn more. Well, 2 Peter chapter 2 is parallel with Jude. You'll find a lot of the same exact wording, the same teaching. They both are chapters about false prophets. And here's where we find the teaching that is parallel to turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, into just a license for sin, into just living a life that indulges the flesh with no regard for what God is telling us and thinking that there are no earthly consequences for our sins. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. It says, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, meaning that it's just a lot of fluff what they preach, not a lot of meat on the bone, they allure through the lusts of the flesh. How do they get people to listen to them? Because they appeal to the lust of the flesh. They tell people what they want to hear because they're giving people permission to go out and do all these things and to live a very loose life. He says, they allure through the lust of the flesh through much wantonness. Now that word wantonness is synonym with lasciviousness. With much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error, watch this, while they promised them liberty. Oh, Christian liberty, free in Christ. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. Go to Galatians 5. So the Bible's saying that these teachers will promise them liberty and allure through the lust of the flesh, basically advertising this doctrine, saying, oh, this is a great doctrine. Because it just, it just gives you such freedom. I mean, you know, you don't wake up in the morning feeling all guilty about breaking God's rules. You don't go through life stressed out about a bunch of do's and don'ts. You just wake up and just breathe in the grace of God and just realize, you know, God loves me and he's pleased with me and he's happy with me. And, you know, he just wants to have a relationship with me. And if the Holy Spirit prompts me, I'm going to follow it. But I don't need to go into the Bible and find all the rules and start obeying them. I'm going to wait till the Holy Spirit brings that up to me or whatever. And they promise people liberty. They make this sound very appealing. But in reality, living a sinful life is anything but liberty. And that's why it said that they promised them liberty, but they themselves are the servants. That's the opposite of being free in a sense, you're a servant. He said, they are servants of corruption for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. This is like when Jesus said in John chapter eight, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. You see, living a life of no rules might seem like freedom. And I want every child and every teenager to listen up and look at me right now. Let me say this to you, young people. You might feel like your parents have a lot of restrictions and rules or that Pastor Anderson preaches a lot of do's and don'ts and that the church is really restraining you and constraining you. And you think that if you just leave your parents' house, you just turn 18 and just move out, that you can just live however you want. Oh, it's going to be such a great feeling of freedom. Listen to me. It's going to to bring you into bondage. You're going to be enslaved way more than when you are a servant to Christ. The devil is a much harsher taskmaster than the Lord is. God's yoke is easy. He said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. It says, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not grievous, the Bible says. But you know what? The devil, he doesn't care whether he grieves you or not. And when you go out and say, oh, man, it's so great to just be able to just drink alcohol. You know, my parents said no. The church said no. But why can't I have a little fun and drink alcohol? Alcohol will make you its slave. Have you ever heard of being a slave to the bottle? Oh, but that would never happen to you. Yes, it will. Every alcoholic began as a social drinker. You start out, you drink, eh, well, you know, then you lose your judgment. Eh, I might as well have another one. Eh, you know, why not have a third? And one becomes four and four becomes six. And I already preached a whole sermon about that last week. But let me tell you something. There are many people who are slaves to alcohol and drunkenness. They don't get up every morning and do what they want to do. They get up and seek alcohol because they have to, because they must, because they are enslaved to it. Every person who smokes cigarettes, they don't make a decision every time they pull out a cigarette. They don't say, hmm, do I want to smoke? Yes. You know, no. They actually have to smoke because it's an addiction. 
okay? Oh man, my parents told me not to go to the casino, but what's a little harmless fun? Yeah, until you get enslaved, until you're addicted to gambling and ruin your whole life. Okay? You say, oh, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna look at some pornography. You know, who, what's the big deal? It's just looking. What's the big deal? Yeah, until you're addicted to it. And guess what? That's what happens. People get addicted to it. Hear about it all the time. And so, there are all kinds of sins. We could go down the list of other sins. You know, those are just a few sins that I'm throwing out there that can become addictive, that can become an addiction. When you just live a life of lasciviousness, wantonness, where you're just going to do whatever and you think it's freedom. Okay, let me ask you this, young teenage man that's so smart. How free are you going to be when you knock up some girl and get her pregnant? You're going to be paying child support for the next 18 years. That's not freedom. When somebody's deducting huge amounts out of your check to pay for your bastard child and, and it being raised in a way that you might not even approve of, but you're still paying for it. That's not freedom. That's not free. That's not liberty. Oh, I'm just free. I can just, and, and look, there are even, some of these teachers, these false prophets that Jude warns us about, are even teaching now that it's okay to basically go to bed with somebody before you're married. And they teach that the Bible doesn't condemn it anywhere. And by the way, that's what the Jews teach, the Judaism. In Judaism, premarital, you know what, is accepted. It's, it's, it's virtually across the board accepted. Why? Because they basically are teaching a lasciviousness. Oh, you, you guys are too strict, you know, expecting us to wait till we get married. You're too strict. And then they teach that it's liberty, but actually it brings bondage. It brings enslavement. How free as a bird are you going to be, young lady, when you get pregnant and you're a single mother? Oh, that's a really free as a bird. I guarantee you that my wife has a lot more freedom than a single mother. Why? Because her husband's paying the bills. She doesn't have to go clock in, clock out, put on a hairnet, put on a name tag, be under CC television. No, no, no. She gets up and she actually does what she wants. Because God is the one who gives freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen. Amen. You say, well, to me, liberty means never having an alarm clock. <laughs> wake up when I want to wake up. But here's the problem with that. If you just wake up when you want to wake up and you never have an alarm clock, I'll tell you the enslavement that's going to bring, not having any money. Right. And then you have to rely on other people and then you're not free anymore. Right. Have you ever heard of financial freedom? I mean, money gives you some freedom. And I'm not preaching to be rich. I'm saying that if you go out and work and pay your own way and make your own money and provide for your own family, you can make choices for yourself that you can't make if you don't have any money and you're relying on other people right. to pay for you. So actually setting the alarm clock and getting up early and going and working a long day actually brings freedom because it brings a paycheck that you can spend on what you want as opposed to people who just live a... You know who lives probably the most footloose and fancy free life children? Homeless bums. <laughs> Nobody tells them what to do. Nobody makes them get up in the morning and go to work. They never get in trouble with their parents. But is that what you want to be, kids? You want to be a bum? You want to be out there in the hot sun, waving a flag, holding up a, 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 a sign that says, you know, anything helps, God bless? Is that what you want? Or do you want to go in your air-conditioned house after a long day's work and eat a well-earned meal and sleep a good night's sleep? Because the sleep of a laboring man is, is sweet, the Bible says. <laughs> Galatians chapter 5, is that where I had you turn? And I got to hurry. Verse 13. For brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Watch this. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So the Bible balances this idea of, yes, we have liberty. Yes, we're free in Christ. Yes, we're not under the law, but under grace. But does that mean that we should use our liberty as an occasion for the flesh? Should we use the fact that Christ has given us liberty to just indulge the flesh? That's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, is what that is. Verse 14, for all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. See, if you're led of the Spirit, God's not going to lead you into sin. 
So if you're truly led of the Spirit, then yeah, you're not under the law because the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient. You see, what it's saying is if you actually love your neighbor and you actually do what's right because you want to and because of the prompting of the Holy Spirit, you wouldn't be breaking God's laws in the first place. So you wouldn't even have to worry about the do's and the don'ts if you're walking in the Spirit. But what they're doing is walking in the flesh, saying that they're walking in the Spirit, and saying, therefore, don't tell me about God's laws. I'm in the Spirit. It's like, well, no, you're not in the Spirit if you're breaking His laws. Because if you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So when I see you committing fornication, I know you're not walking in the Spirit. That's right. When I see you watching porno, you're not walking in the Spirit. When I see you drinking, you're not walking in the Spirit. That's the opposite. That's spirits. Wine and spirits. That's not the Spirit. That's the spirits. Oh, that's why you got confused. When I see you smoking a cigarette and drinking and doing drugs and partying and saying, oh, I'm free in Christ. You know, when I see, I mean, I remember there was a kid that walked into my Baptist youth group wearing a Marilyn Manson t-shirt. And I said, that's a wicked t-shirt. How dare you wear that in here? I said, you are supposedly a Christian. This wasn't a first time visitor. I said, that's satanic. And everybody's like, oh, don't judge. Don't judge. We're free in Christ, bro. I'm not kidding. I've sat in church. I mean, look, Brother Dave Burzens told me he was in a church where the guy took the offering in a Metallica t-shirt. Okay, my dad visited a church a few years ago where the guy taking the offering. These aren't visitors. These aren't people that just got saved five minutes ago. The guy taking the offering was wearing a Hooters t-shirt in church on Sunday morning. I mean, think about that. This is the kind of junk, and anybody who speaks up about it is called a legalist. Anybody who tries to bring in some sanity in the voice of reason is told, you're bringing us under bondage. We're free in Christ. No, no, no. These people want to use liberty for an occasion to the flesh, and they want to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Go to Romans 5. Actually, I'm sorry, go to Romans, yeah, Romans 5. We'll start in Romans 5. I'll read for you from 1 Peter 2, verse 15. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Watch this. As free, God is saying he wants us to live as free, like we're free, comma, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. He's saying, yeah, we've been given liberty. Yeah, no matter whether we do right or wrong, we're still saved. Don't use that as a cloak of maliciousness. What's a cloak? It's a coat. It's an overgarment that could basically hide, you know, the sawed-off shotgun, as it were. You know, you're using it as a cloak of maliciousness, hiding your ill intentions. You're using liberty to gratify the flesh. You're using liberty as a cloak for your maliciousness and your wickedness. You're hiding your sin behind this. Oh, it's just liberty. Liberty. He says, no, use your liberty to serve Christ. Use your liberty to serve one another. Don't use liberty to gratify the flesh and to break all God's commandments and displease him. Romans 5, 19, for as by one man's disobedience, Adam, Many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, that's Jesus, shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So what the Bible is telling us is that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Okay, God's grace is sufficient to pay for all of our sins, meaning that anyone who believes on Jesus Christ, no matter how much sin they've committed, can go to heaven. God's grace will pay for all their sin. So no matter how many bad sins you've done before you got saved, once you believe on Christ, his grace covers it all. It's enough. It's sufficient. And if sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Amen? Look what he says in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, though. He just finished explaining to us in chapters 3, 4, and 5, all three of those chapters, wall to wall, 3, 4, and 5 is just all about how we're saved by faith. It's not by works. It's not by the law. It's all by grace. Where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. But then he explains in verse 1 of chapter 6, what shall we say then in light of that? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So if we sin, if we continue in sin, grace will abound. 
No question about that. If you say that God's grace won't abound, that's a false doctrine. But should we continue in sin just because God's grace will abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer there? You know, well, why would we want to do that? Is that really God's purpose for our lives to just keep living a sinful, wicked life after we're saved? No. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So we should do works, but we're not saved by works. And we don't have to do works to be saved. And there are people who don't do works and yet they're saved because they believed on Christ, Romans 4, 5. But should we do that? Absolutely not. Why not? Look at verse, uh, jump down to verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. And this is what the new evangelicals will repeat over and over again. The non denom You know, not under the law. We're under grace when you try to preach against sin. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. And what is sin? The transgression of the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. So because we're not under the law but under grace, is that saying that we should sin? No, he's saying, no, we should not sin. Why not? Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Once again, we clearly see that sin enslaves us and that it's a fake liberty that tells you to live however after you're saved. It's a fake liberty. It's a false liberty. It's a fraud. It's a promised liberty that does not materialize. Now, let me just mention one false teacher out there. Now, and, and don't get me wrong because I want to say this. This is not a rare doctrine. Taking it to its extreme is pretty rare. But I'm telling you, every new evangelical church that I've ever seen had this mentality to an extent. It's very common. It's very prevalent, this, this uh, leaning. But there's a guy out there who sort of takes this to an extreme, and his name's Joseph Prince. Who's ever heard of this guy? He looks sort of like a cross between Prince <laughs> and Michael Jackson and Elvis Presley all kind of rolled into one. Okay, so he kind of looks like a rock star. He's got the, you know, the feathered out hairdo and he's got the tight pants and the tight leather jacket and the pencil tie and he's real smooth and slick and he's preaching on a platform washed in purple light and he basically teaches, he teaches some right things and this is how people get sucked in. He teaches some right things because he talks a lot about God's grace. He talk, and he'll, he talks a lot about how you can't lose your salvation. Well, that's a great doctrine because you can't lose your salvation, right? So whenever lies are taught, there's truth mixed in. So he teaches a lot of true things. But let me just explain this to you. The problem with most preachers is not what they say. It's what they don't say. Yeah, right. Let me say that again. The problem with most preachers is not what they say, it's what they don't say. You can go to the average liberal church and listen to 25-minute sermonette. They're not really going to say anything bad a lot of the time, but it's just that they don't say much of anything. Okay, and Joseph Prince, I don't care what anybody thinks, is a positive-only preacher. Just, that's why he fills in for Joel Osteen's pulpit. That's why the two are buddies. That's why he travels in those circles because of the fact that Joel Osteen is a positive-only preacher and it's all about the money. Look, are they teaching the error of Cain? No, because they're not really, you know, pushing a works-based salvation, Joseph Prince, that is. But what he will do is run after the error of Balaam greedily for reward. Okay, greedily preach what people want to hear, allure through the lusts of the flesh, and teach licentiousness and this Christian liberty we're under grace, take it to this extreme where the God of Joseph Prince doesn't chastise anybody. He doesn't chastise. We're all under his blessing. We're all, he's pleased with all of us. We're all just in good graces with him all the time. And so there's no reason to ever feel bad or guilty or anything like that. You know what? That's just a lie. And there's so many scriptures that could disprove that. And what it does is it sets up this straw man 
for the work salvation teachers to attack when you preach on by grace through faith, then they'll try to lump you in with this weird doctrine like, oh, well, you're one of these people that just says to live however you want. And they lump you in with this, what, what they call the hyper grace, where it's this thing of not only do you not need to do works to be saved, you don't even have to do works, period. I mean, it's just stupid. Yeah, we should do works. They don't have anything to do with salvation, but we should obey the commandments. We should do right. We should get the sin out of our lives. But, you know, according to Joseph Prince, it's just, it's all done, and we just sit back and just enjoy our standing in Christ. And, of course, the guy has 22,000 people in his church or something, because that's a pretty popular message, just do whatever you want. God, he said, the Holy Spirit will never convict you of sin. That's what he said. And, of course, that's a popular message. Why? Because people in the last days, the Bible said, would heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, what they want to hear, what they want to be told. And the Bible says that they'll make merchandise of you. So there's all these clips of his preaching on YouTube, and then it says, hey, if you want the full sermon, go to his website to download the MP3 of one sermon, $7.99 for a download of one sermon. Okay, so I have 1,600 of my sermons on faithforwardbaptist.org for free download. So what if I charge eight bucks each? Then I guess to get the whole repertoire, you'd have to spend about, what, 13 grand just to listen to all the sermons from Faith Forward Baptist? I mean, imagine spending $7.99 and listening to an, a one-hour sermon. It's like, well, okay, that's an expensive habit if you want to listen to a lot of preaching. <laughs> But it's about money, that's why. It's not about just preaching the truth, getting the truth out there. He sells the CD for $7.99, one sermon. DVDs are $28 for two or three sermons on a DVD or whatever. You know, and look, I'm not against businesses selling things. Businesses, but you know what? The church itself should not be selling things, number one. And number two, it's charging those kind of prices it shows you what the motivation is when basically he's not even putting it out there at all the information you got to get the download and it's all the same just tell you what you want to hear tickle your ears kind of false teaching you say well why you know why are you coming down on joseph prince well how about because he doesn't use the king james he used the new king james but worse than that he doesn't even believe the new king james i looked up i wanted to see what he said about jude where Jude says, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, because that's what he's doing. Yeah. So I wondered what he'd say about that. I found a video where he's basically, he gets up and says, oh, this doesn't say what you think it means. <laughs> Jude verse 4. This doesn't mean what you think it means. He, he, first, he, first he read the verse in like five versions. He read it in five versions, right? But then he proceeded to explain how all the versions are wrong. All 400 and some English Bibles are all wrong. Let me go back to the Greek and tell you what it really means. And this guy, was just, this guy goes back to the Greek a lot. So not only is he using the wrong Bible, then he, when it doesn't say what he wants it to say, he'll just change it and say, well, the Greek. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think they speak Greek in Singapore, where Joseph Prince is from. And I doubt that he would do very well if we dropped him in Athens without a tour guide. But he's going to say, oh, the Greek, the Greek, all these 400 versions, they're all wrong. It doesn't really mean turning the grace of God to lasciviousness. It means that you've swapped out the grace of God for lasciviousness. It's a swap. So basically, preaching the grace of God prevents us from lasciviousness is what that's, but that's, no, that's not what that verse is saying. That verse is saying you're turning the grace of God. You're changing it into lasciviousness. It doesn't say you're swapping it. And by the way, every English Bible says that. Even the versions that are wrong, they get that part right, at least. He's just coming in with some strange translation. I mean, it's pretty bad. It's bad enough when you're, sh when you're shopping Bible versions until you find the one that says what you want it to say. Shopping versions. You'll, you'll see preachers that'll use like five different versions in one sermon because they shop around for the point that they, it's like people who go to, a, uh, keep going to a doctor until one will give you the oxycodone. Yeah, right. right? You'll find one eventually. Oh, it hurts? Where does it hurt? Everywhere. Okay, here you go. Oxycodone. There you go. You know, you'll get, you'll get it if you want, right? 
So that's the thing. They searched versions until they find it. This guy, when he can't find it, then he just said, well, these are all wrong. This is the Greek. He doesn't want to face what this verse teaches because he's guilty of it because it's about him. And here's how he, he tries to say it's not about him. He says, well, these people are teaching the way of Cain, and we know I'm not teaching the way of Cain because I'm, I'm not teaching works at all. What you understand is that this, this, this chapter is warning about lots of different false prophets that do lots of different things. Look, when he says that they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, it's not saying that necessarily it's the same person doing both of those things. It's not necessarily the same person that's in the way of Cain that's teaching the gainsaying of Korah. These are various types of false doctrine and false uh, things that could be taught. Now, I want to tie this in with something here. I want to use this as an illustration for something else, and that is the subject of marriage, because I think that marriage is a beautiful picture of salvation. We talk a lot about salvation being likened unto a father and a son, because the Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. But in addition to using that as an illustration, the Bible also likens salvation unto marriage. Okay, let me give you some scriptures on that. And if you would, flip over to Romans chapter 7. We're going to go to Romans 7 and then Ephesians 5, if you want to find those two places. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Okay, so again, marriage there is being used as a picture with Christ being the husband and uh, the church being the wife or the, the, the believers being the wife or things of that nature. The Bible often uses that. So look at Romans 7 verse 2. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So you see how the Bible is saying... Basically, that we are to be married to Christ. That's a symbol there. That's a, a picture of salvation. Marriage pictures salvation. Look at Ephesians 5. I'll show you further. Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. So notice, the husband and wife is like Christ and the church. Do you see that? Even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body, therefore as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So we see over and over again in this passage that marriage is likened unto the relationship between Christ and the church, between Christ and us as believers. Now, why is this illustration so applicable? Well, because of the fact that once we get married, it's supposed to be permanent, right? It's supposed to be till death do us part. Amen. And staying married is not based on our actions or our deeds. It's based on a promise, right? It's not based on, well, I like the way you're acting, therefore I'm going to stay married to you. I like being around you. I enjoy your company. Therefore, let's stay married. No, it's based on a promise. I'm staying married because I promised. Because you promised till death do us part. It's a vow. Okay. Well, it's the same thing with salvation. Salvation is not based on our actions or how we act, how we feel. It's based on a promise. The Bible says this is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. So God promised eternal life unto all those that believe, and he promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, when you get married, that's what you're promising. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And it ends at death, right? When, when the husband dies, it's over. When the wife dies, it's over. It's not forever and ever and ever. It's till death. But stop and think about this. We're in Christ. We've been espoused unto Christ. Here's the thing. He's never going to die. Because the Bible says 
He was dead, but now he lives forevermore. And not only that, we're never going to die. Because the Bible says, Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Amen. So our salvation is eternal. So that's part of the reason why it's likened unto marriage. Another reason why it's likened unto marriage is because in marriage there's an authority structure where the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Just as the church is to be subject unto Christ, meaning that Christ rules over the church, the husband is to rule over his wife. The Bible says in Genesis 3.16, he shall rule over thee, about Adam and Eve. So there's an authority structure. That's also another similarity between the two. So when we see these similarities and understand that marriage is a beautiful picture of salvation, that should show us why God hates divorce, why God said that he hates putting away, because what it does is it, it ruins that picture. It all, it, it, it's like as if you could lose your salvation. You know what I mean? Like as if it could end prematurely when in reality it can't end because God will never leave us nor forsake us. And the Bible says that he has us in his hand, inside the Father's hand, and no man is able to pluck us out of his hand. Now, this is why this is such an important thing to talk about because just as we could turn the grace of God into lasciviousness in regard to salvation, right? In marriage, people could turn the grace of marriage into a license to treat their spouse however. What do I mean by that? Well, if I know that my wife's never going to leave me or forsake me, I know that it's till death. I know that she's made that promise. I can't break that promise. Does that mean that I should just treat my wife poorly because who cares? What's she going to do about it? She can't leave. Is that a good attitude? Now, isn't that similar to a Christian who has an attitude of, oh, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven no matter what? I'm going to go out and live however, because I'm going to heaven anyway. That's just like a husband who would say, well, my wife's never going to leave me, so I'm just going to treat her however. Or a wife who says, well, I know my husband's never going to divorce me. I know my husband's never going to leave me, so I'm not going to obey him. What's he going to do about it? See how it's the same type of a thing, same type of a situation? So we could turn grace into lasciviousness, not just in regard to salvation, but in regard to marriage as well. Now, here's the thing about that. Truly, no matter how my wife treats me, I will never leave her. I will never divorce my wife. No matter how bad she treats me, I'm not leaving. And no matter how bad she treats me, or, or no matter how bad I treat her, you know, right, honey? <laughs> right? You know, she's not going to leave me, but, but here's the thing about that. That's the way it should be, right, amongst Christians. They should have that attitude that, of course, it's do or die, no matter what, till death do us part. But guess what, though? Even if that's the case, you should still put forth an effort to love your wife, husbands. And you should still put forth the effort, wives, to reverence and submit to your husband. Whether or not it's going to make or break the actual union itself. You still should, just as we should obey Christ's commandments, if you love me, keep my commandments. Okay, well, if you love your husband, obey your husband. And if you love your wife, show your wife that you love her. Demonstrate that love. Live out that love and make it evident to her. And don't just have an attitude that says, well, she's stuck with me. I'll work on other areas of my life that are a little more volatile. You know? This is, this, was, this, geez, this is in the bag. That's called taking things for granted. Now, we shouldn't take the Lord for granted, but here's the good news. Even if we take the Lord for granted, he'll never leave us or forsake us because he's perfect. But did you know that your husband or wife, they're not God, they might break their promise. Now, God forbid that they would do that, but you know what? It wouldn't be the first time. If your wife leaves you, it wouldn't be the first time that that happened in an independent fundamental Baptist church. Would it? Would it be the first time that a, 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 a godly Christian family was in church and serving the Lord and then they neglected their marriage and neglected their marriage and eventually the husband got sick of it and said, hey, I'm sick of being treated like garbage. I'm leaving. Now, obviously that's wicked for him to leave. Obviously, that's wicked for her to leave. If she says, I'm sick and tired of being unloved and neglected and treated like dirt, I'm leaving. Look, that's wicked, but it happens. 
it's out there. Why? Because your spouse is not as consistent as God is. He's not as trustworthy as God is. So therefore, number one, don't have this attitude toward your wife or husband. Oh, they're stuck with me, so I'm going to act however and take it for granted. Because number one, that's wrong. That's not love. If you love them, you'll do it out of love, not out of fear. But number two, don't do that. Because you know what? It might not be as secure as you think. Because stranger things have happened than adultery. Adultery happens. Divorce happens. And I'm not, and the people who do it are wicked as hell. But let me tell you something. Don't push your spouse to that. Yeah, it's their fault when they do it. But why would you push them to that? Okay, let's find that concept in scripture. Go to 1 Corinthians 10. I'm not making things up this morning. I'm preaching the Bible. These are not man's philosophies, man's wisdom that say, hey, don't push your spouse. Don't push your husband. Don't push your wife. Don't test it to see how far you can push it. What does the Bible say? Let's get back on the subject of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. Joyce Meyer, Joseph Prince, Joel Osteen. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Here's the key verse, verse 9. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Let me ask you this. What does it mean to tempt Christ? What does it mean to tempt him? It doesn't mean to tempt him with evil. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. What it means to tempt, it means to test them. When God tempted Abraham, he was testing him. He was trying him. So the Bible is saying, don't test God. Don't try to push God and see how far you're going to push him and see how much you can get away with it. See, they tempted the Lord in the wilderness. They kept pushing and pushing, and then he pushed back. And he sent fiery serpents to destroy them. Now, what was the sin that, God, that caused God to send the fiery serpents? It was complaining. It was murmuring. Read the story, Numbers 21. They murmured, they complained, they whined, and they kept pushing and pushing, and God called their bluff. Now, God's not going to call your bluff in the sense of sending you to hell, because he'll never send us to hell. Once we have believed on Christ, we have eternal life, we shall never perish. But you know what? God could call your bluff by bringing serious chastisement into your life, serious punishment, serious calamity. The Bible says, he that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. You know, don't tempt God. Don't tempt Christ. Don't just keep murmuring or fornicating or drinking and just keep pushing it and tempting Christ. He says the same thing in Hebrews 3. You don't have to turn there. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. He says, don't tempt me. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Don't try to test him and prove him. And we're not talking about in a good way, like, hey, we're going to see what God can do if we give him our best. We're talking about the kind of tempting God that says, well, you know, let's see if God is really even going to punish me if I do this. Okay, back to what we were talking about, because remember this ties in with marriage. Don't be a wife who wants to just tempt her husband and test him. And you know what? There are a lot of wives out there that push and push their husband. They're just trying to find a boundary. They just keep pushing him. Keep on trying to provoke him, trying to get a rise out of him, trying to get a reaction out of him. It's out there. Or if we were to flip that over, the way that a husband would tempt his wife would be to just, it would be more of a, instead of a more active tempting, like the wife who's just nagging and whining and complaining and cursing and attacking him and telling him off and refusing to obey, refusing to submit. I think on the husband's side, tempting the wife would be more like just 
how much can I just neglect her and ignore her and just not show any love and she'll still put up with it, right? I mean, just, just see how far you can push it. See how much, I mean, look, it's sort of like my Hyundai Sonata that I used to drive. I didn't really give it a lot of tender loving care. You know, I tend to abuse property, okay, I confess. I don't treat things very well. Be careful if you loan me stuff, okay? I'll just put it that way. Because I don't really treat things that well. You know, I, and I'm not saying that that's good. I'm just being honest. And it's funny because my dad is the exact opposite. He cleans his motorcycle with a toothbrush, and it looks like it just came off the assembly line yesterday after he's had it for years. But I, on the other hand, I tend to have a philosophy of, well, things are to be used, you know, so let's drive it till the wheels fall off. So I had this Hyundai Sonata, and man, you know, I didn't treat that thing. First of all, I was constantly tossing the keys to young guys and letting them borrow it to do work. To, you know, I'd send them on a fire alarm job for me or something. Here, borrow my car. Here, or use my car for soul winning. Or here, use this car. And of course, they're just grinding and gears and, you know, just whatever. They, they do all kinds of just irresponsible things with it. And then when I would drive it, I would change the oil every 12 or 13,000 miles. <laughs> consistently okay I mean I remember one time I was out driving in New Mexico and I was in like a blizzard snowstorm in northern New Mexico and I just was just do or die I got to get to this job and I was driving there were these big snow drifts in the road and I just kept bashing through them and if you remember my Hyundai Sonata who remembers that car that I had that red car who remembers how the front of it was like sewn together with bailing wire yeah that was from me just bashing through these snow drifts in the road, just trying to get to this job, and the road was blocked with snow, and I'm just like, you know, just, just hitting these snow drifts, just busting through them. And I think, like, if I slow down, I'm going to get stuck. I just got to keep going. You know, and I mean, the inside of the car was just, I'm shoving, like, 10-foot sticks of conduit into a sedan. It fit. Oh, you can fit a 10-foot stick of conduit in a Hyundai Sonata. You take it, you put the seat down in the back, you stick it through the trunk, shove it all the way up onto the dash, up to the window. So I have like 10-foot sticks of conduit. I'm putting a six-foot ladder inside the Sonata, inside this four-door sedan. I'm shoving all kinds of materials. I'm loading it down with parts. I'm sleeping in it. I'm eating in it. They say, oh, it's bad for the car to let it run all night. I slept in that car hundreds of times with the engine running all night hundreds of times and I'm not exaggerating you think I am I slept in my car regularly two to three nights a week for about seven years okay so you do the math so I was constantly sleeping in the car trying to save money on business trips and just in a hurry didn't have time to get a hotel just pull off at the rest area whatever so the bottom line is I didn't really take care of this car I mean I was tempting this car I mean I'm basically what am I doing what can I get away with with this car and it still gets me from point A to point B? You know, and, and I, I never, listen to this, that car when it finally just exploded, the engine just like exploded. I had put 355,000 miles on that car and I had only broken down once. I broke down once at around 330,000 miles an hour. That was the first time I ever broke down. I mean, that was an amazing car. Either, either Hyundai makes amazing cars or God was just supernaturally blessing that car or both. I don't, you know, but it wasn't because I took such good care of it. I'll, I'll tell you that much. So I had 355,000 miles on it and the thing just, the engine just <laughs> black smoke. I had a tow truck come pick it up and I just tossed him the keys and said, I'm done with this car. It's all yours. <laughs> Best car I've ever had. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. The whole time I had that car, the only thing I did, I changed the oil every 12, 13, 15,000 miles. Admittedly, I would put that many miles on pretty fast. I, I changed the tires, obviously. And I changed the, uh, the spark plugs once. I never changed a belt. I never added antifreeze or changed the antifreeze it just it was the same it was the same antifreeze from when I bought the car was, I'm not kidding it was a 2008 Hyundai yeah seriously <laughs> well you know what's funny is that 
I, I talked about this in a sermon, or I did a blog post about it, and the, the Hyundai dealer from Las Vegas wrote to me and said, your story about your car is the most beautiful story I've ever heard about it. <laughs> he probably tells it to everybody when he's selling that. But you know, I, pers I know about five people who bought a Hyundai Sonata because of me telling that. And, you know, mo as far as I know, for most of it, it was a great car for him. I, I think it's a good car, yeah. This message was brought to you in part by Hyundai. But anyway, <laughs> but the point is, you know, here's the thing. Your wife is not just this car that you just drive it till the wheels fall off, you're spilling food, spilling drinks, shove in conduit, shove in a ladder, loan it to whoever, just let the thing run all night with no rest. I mean, look, eventually, and it might last for 330, you know, I'm trying to get more than 350,000 miles out of my wife, amen? So, you know, I don't want her to just eventually, and here's the thing, I didn't think there was anything wrong with that car because that car was consistent. I mean, that car was, but eventually it blew up. Well, here's the thing. Eventually your wife's going to blow up. Eventually your husband's going to blow up. And here's the thing. When your car blows up, you toss the keys and say, hey, that was worth $20,000 or whatever I paid for it. I don't know, how much was that car? About 20 grand or something? That, you don't just toss the keys and say, hey, that was a good ride. That was a good five years. That was a good 355,000 miles. Good run. <laughs> Move on to the next one. Guess what? You can't do that with your wife. When your wife blows up, when your husband blows up, you don't just toss the keys. It's not that simple, is it? It's a lot simpler to sign over the title to that Hyundai when it blows up. It blew up. We were on the way. I was on the way to who was with me when it, when it blew up? Wasn't somebody with me? Remember, we were on the way to hiking Hell's Gate. You know what? All the people who, go, you know, the problem is I take people on these extreme hikes and then they quit the church and that, none of them are here. That car was filled with like four, there were four other guys in that car and they've all quit the church because I took them on these hellish hikes. It was called, I took them on this hike called Hell's Gate and it was on the way to Hell's Gate. We were driving to Payson. We were going up the hill and it was just you know, black smoke is coming out and everything. We pulled over and I said, the hike must go on. <laughs> we got it towed into town. We got it towed into Payson, tossed them the keys, called a cab to, and said, take us to the Hell's Gate trailhead. <laughs> and we hiked all day. My wife picked us up that night, you know, and drove us back to Phoenix. I never saw that car again. But you know what? That's, that was kind of just easy to be cool and nonchalant. Hey, the hike must go on. Let's do it. Nuts to this car. Call a cab. The hike can to Hell's Gate. Here we come. 16-mile brutal hike. But here's the thing. The hike doesn't go on when your wife blows up or your husband blows up. Life doesn't just go on, okay? You do irreparable damage. And so we need to not just take our spouse for granted, right? And just think to ourselves, oh, well, since it's till death, this doesn't need any maintenance. This doesn't need any effort. Look, marriage takes effort on both people's part. Right. Husbands need to put forth an effort. Wives need to put forth an effort. And there are far too many people who are just going through the motions in their marriage and they're not putting any effort in. And this, is, and this isn't just directed at women or men because I see the same problems on both sides. It's not just all the men's fault or, oh, it's all the women's fault. You know, there are plenty of men who just completely ignore, neglect their wife, don't have, take any interest in her, and just avoid her, and just they don't spend time with her. And then there are plenty of wives who are just tempting and provoking their husband by just being a nag and a pain and, you know, not obeying and not submit. Look, there's problems on both sides. Both people need to make an effort. Both the husband and the wife need to make an effort to do a good job at maintaining their marriage and not to just have this hyper grace marriage of just, well, no matter what I do, my wife's pleased with me because we're married, amen? Send your check and become a, a destined to reign funding partner. Ah, you know, Joseph Prince. You know, okay, try that on your marriage. Yeah, no matter what I do, my wife just always is happy with me. No matter what I do, my husband's always happy. No, they're not. 
And by the way, especially with women, sometimes their, their, their anger is bottled up and it's not expressed until the explosion. Because men tend to be more expressive of their feelings, right? Men tend to, to, to tell you how they really feel. Men are very direct in their communication, right? Whereas women tend to be a little bit more indirect sometimes with the way that they communicate. So, you know, if a man's not happy, he's going to speak up about it sooner. Hey, I don't like the way things are going here. But oftentimes women are just kind of like, no, it's fine. It's all right. No, go ahead. Go ahead. It's okay. We can cancel our, our dinner together. You can go bowling with your buddies again. or You know, it's fine. Go. No, go ahead. Have a great time. You know? And then he's out the door. It's like, <laughs> And a lot of times when men, when their wife leaves them, it, they don't even see it coming. You know what I'm saying? Like, they don't even see it coming. They're like, whoa, I thought everything was fine. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it's just they come home one day and all their wife's stuff is gone. Yep. And the divorce papers are there. Do you think that that never happens? Or worse yet, they think everything's fine. Oh, I thought my wife was totally satisfied. I thought everything was great. And then they catch their wife with another man. It happens all the time. And look, it's wicked as hell. Don't get me wrong. There's no excuse for adultery. There's no excuse. It's wait the Bible says the adulterer and the adulteress should be put to death. Major sin. Wicked. Ungodly. But here's the thing. Does that mean that, oh, well, adultery is so wicked, that means I'm just going to keep pushing my spouse toward that because I know they're never going to do it. So I'll just keep pushing and keep pushing. No, no, no. That's stupid because, number one, you're wicked to, to tempt that way. And number two, maybe they will go off that cliff because they're a sinner. A sinner. God forbid, but maybe they will. And I'm telling you, men, and let me just focus in on the men for a minute. Let me tell you something. Your wife may not be happy with you. Your wife may not be satisfied with you. Your wife may not feel that she is getting what she wants out of that relationship. And you know what? You better make sure and give your wife what she needs in this relationship. That's what the Bible says. This is not my opinion. Okay, the Bible says that we are supposed to, and if you would go to, go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. And remember Galatians 5.13 said this, For brethren, you've been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And here's the thing about that. You know, marriage is a kind of liberty in a sense. Because when you're dating... You're constantly, you know, you don't, they can break up with you at any time, so you're kind of on your best behavior, right? When you're dating because it's not a done deal. It's not a sure thing yet, so you're really on your best behavior. Okay, then when you get married, you can relax a little bit and let your hair down because you're not just on thin ice, right? But here's the thing, and that's good. That's a good feel. I like being married. I like the fact of not having to constantly be you know, wooing and courting and dating and feeling like I have to impress and, you know, because I'm on thin. I, you know, it's nice to just be able to realize, hey, it's a done deal, right? So there's a certain freedom or liberty where you can kind of be yourself, you can relax a little bit, you can let your hair down because you're married, you're not dating anymore, right? But you don't want to use that liberty, though, and abuse that liberty of just, well, I'm just not going to try at all. I'm not going to try to make myself appealing at all to my wife or to my husband. I'm not going to try to be, you know, a, a, a fun person to be around at all. I'm just going to be a pain in the rear end because I can. See what I'm saying? We should use liberty to serve one another. We should use liberty to love one another. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 10, And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. That's a pretty clear verse teaching that it's wrong for a wife to leave her husband, period. But look what it says in the next verse. But and if she depart. So what's it saying? It's wrong, but guess what? Some of them are going to do it. You see that? But and if they depart, but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. Go to verse 1. It says, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, 
and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not, for your incontinency. He's not saying here, oh, Christians are all above adultery. No Christian would ever commit adultery. No. He said, if you're married, you better have that physical relationship. Otherwise, Satan will tempt you for your incontinency. And notice, he's not just saying that to the men, is he? He said it both ways. He said it to the man and the woman. Now, most people think of this being as more of a man thing. Most people think of this as, oh, the wife is withholding the physical relationship from her husband. That's how most people think this would work. But did you know that that's only 80% of the time? If you look at statistically, 80% of husbands, or 80% of people who would say, hey, my spouse is, is denying me that physical relationship, 80% of them are men and 20% of them are women. 20% is substantial. That's a lot. 20%, that's not, not 2%, 20%. Where it's the woman who's saying, my husband is refusing to have a physical relationship with me. So it's not just husbands whose wives are, are withholding a physical relationship with them. It's wives whose husbands are withholding that physical relationship. Look, this is just a taking of your spouse for granted and just tempting them and pushing them and just seeing how far you can push it. And listen to me, someday it might blow up in your face. You better make sure if you're a husband that you attend unto the needs of your wife. And if you're a wife, you better make sure that you attend unto the needs of your husband in the physical area. But even outside of the physical area, husbands and wives have other needs. Men have a need of being respected and honored by their wife. Wives have a need to be loved and appreciated by their wife. Both people have a need of companionship and friendship and spending time together. And you might think to yourself, well, I'm totally satisfied with this marriage. Okay, but is your wife totally satisfied? Oh, well, I'm totally satisfied. Yeah, but is your husband totally satisfied? You better watch out because let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. What's the whole sermon about? It's about taking things for granted and it's about abusing liberty. That's what it's about. It's about turning the grace of God into lasciviousness or turning the grace of your husband or the grace of your wife into lasciviousness. It's about just, oh, I can get away with it? Well, then I'm just going to do whatever I want. Well, guess what? There are consequences to that. And so we need to make sure that just because we're saved eternally, doesn't mean that we ignore the do's and don'ts that God has for us. And just because we're married lifelong, we shouldn't just ignore, you know, working on that relationship. We need to put effort into that relationship and make sure we maintain that thing so that it doesn't just last 355,000 miles, but that it lasts us for life. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for salvation, Lord, and the free gift of your grace, Lord. Help us never to pervert or abuse that gift of grace, Lord, by dressing up like an Elvis impersonator and telling everybody, hey, there's no punishment. God's pleased with you no matter what. God's always happy with you. Wrong, Lord. Help us to walk in trembling and fear, Lord, of our stern father who's ready to discipline us when we do wrong, Lord. Help us to continue to walk in, 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 in uh, the fear of God. Even the New Testament tells us, fear God. And Lord, help us to understand that, you know, just because we are married for life doesn't mean that we should just do whatever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Psalm number 406, Lord's on the Lord's side, Psalm number 406. <laughs> <clears throat> Song number 406 Who is on the Lord's side?